Okay, so good evening, everybody. Um, actually, I have to apologize for the title because uh, part of this, this talk will be about visualizing package clusters as it was in the abstract. But since people were asking me during this conference various stuff about how, how things going in a, a search project I'm involved, with, I'm involved with, I'm going to have uh, both parts. So basically, it will be an update of what we have been doing in, uh, in this pro research project called Mancusi, and also an update on uh, how we are using tools from a previous project called EDOS to do Debian quality assurance on a daily basis and also for um, releases. So, um, will be three parts basically. The third part will be a brief overview of some tools we are using, which comes from a project called EDOS, uh, which descend from quite years, some years ago. Some will be about some new tools, and some will be about presenting stuff which is coming next. So let's start with what was called the EDOS project, which that's the, the word you might have been seeing in some tools like EDOS Deb Check or the Debian Weather. And it's actually about uh, an older research project which was running from uh, 2004 to 2007. It was a European-funded project which involved uh, various universities in, uh, in Europe, among them, there's Paris 7, which is the university I'm currently working with. And also, the project involved various um, Linux distribution companies, like uh, Mandriva and Kaixamakika, which is a Portuguese distribution. And um, the objective of the project was actually helping out we, package maintainers, in uh, creating a um, high-quality distribution. So the focus was on... Uh, Debian maintainers, and in particular in how to, produ to um, produce, manage a distribution like we do every day. And in particular, looking at the formal part of packages, so mainly inter-package dependencies, and how a formal study of these kind of things can help out in uh, doing Q&A quality assurance um, uh, work. So Debian was not officially involved, mainly for the reason that it has no... So it is not a company, and usually when you go to uh, you, the EU, is kind of hard to go with a non-profit association. Uh, but one Debian developer named Ralf Tainen was involved and actually was working in contributing back code to Debian, and it was quite successful. So as a lot of, diff as a lot of research projects, EDUS was split in various work packages according to different subjects. Uh, the part on which I've been mainly involved was actually the first part, so formal management of uh, software dependencies. So actually, nowadays it is becoming more and more a common concept, those of uh, component-based software, but we in Debian and all Linux distribution has been pioneering this concept since quite a while. And the main question of component-based software, which has been addressed in the EDUS project, was this one. So is it possible, given a um, user selection of packages, to install them when we consider that repository as closed. So basically, you took a distribution like Debian is, which is a set of packages, and you ask yourself, can I, in some configuration, whatever con configuration, install each single package? So why we are interested in this? Well, because if you have a distribution whose packages are not installable, well, those packages are not really useful. But still you do work on them, you spend effort in uploading them, you spend quality uh, effort in trace, tracing them, this, the, uh, these bugs and stuff like that. So to do that, basically, in Mancusi they formalized um, a simple mathematical model of a distribution. So it's, it's very simple and it's based on uh, simple proposition logic. And the, the key point of the formalization are dependencies. So we all know this is a snippet of a, a control file, basically. So you have a package, you have its dependence line, sometimes written by us, sometimes written automatically by some tools we use. But still, in the end, what the user uh, receives is a package with a specific line of dependencies like that, that, like that one. So the idea to formalize this kind of relationship between packages is to interpret these kind of lines as formula logic formula, where you have uh, the usual stuff from simple logic, so um, conjunction, disjunction, basically. However, you cannot do that really in a naive manner, because when we say a name of a package in a dependence line, we are not really saying a specific version of a package. We are saying whatever version we have in the archive of that package. So if we just say libc6, it can be whatever version of libc6 it's available, which usually and hopefully is just one. But it can be more than one. 
And uh, actually, we also have virtual packages. So we, c we have some packages in archive which depend on things like mail transport agent, but actually that's not a single package. It's a disjunction of packages. So basically, there's a simple mapping between dependencies and packages, but you have this kind of expansion where you, use a, where you expand a single package name to a um, disjunction of various packages. So given that, how do you model a repository? Well, a repository is, becomes a, a set of packages, okay? Um, to each package, is, uh, each package in that repository is associated to a formula, to a logic formula, like what the one I've shown you before. And in addition to that, globally, you define a set of conflicts. So identify in a given repository all pairs of packages which are not co-installable. Okay, because we are used to declare conflicts uh, in only one way. So we are, a package declares a conflict tovar, towards another package, but the conflict is actually um, bidirectional. So even we only say in one direction that um, a package A conflict with a package B, that's actually the true also in the other sense. So once you've done all that, the question of whether a package is installable or not is uh, equivalent to a problem which is known in computer science called SAT which stands for satisfiability, and the basic basically boils down to deciding whether a given formula is actually satisfiable or not. And um, how, if, how works the mapping? Well, each package P we have in the archive becomes a single variable, which can be true or false, where true means that this package has to be installed and false means that it has not. Each dependency becomes an implication. So the, in the first example, we have seen that a term dependent on libc6 and on either libic or xlibs. Yes, the example is quite old. Uh, and you have this translated into a logic implication. So if you install a term, then you need to install also libc6 and one of the two other packages. So this way you form a mapping between dependencies and um, implication. And additionally, conflicts get translated to formula which states that no two packages which are in conflict can be installed together. So in this slide you see not A and B. That means that you will not be able to have at the same time A and B installed and having your formula satisfiable. Okay? Um, a not so nice consequence of this mapping is that deciding whether a package is installable or not becomes an NP-complete problem, which is a kind of problem which are well known to be really hard and requiring an exponential complexity in the side of the archive. And we have 20,000 packages in the archive. Luckily, all instances we are facing in reality are quite easy to solve. So if we think at the problem of installing with apt a specific version of libc6 in a given uh, package repository, like the one which is shown on the left, you get a big formula which is uh, satisfiable only if a given package manager has a way to install that specific package. So this example is uh, quite small. You just ask for a package, and you get a formula with a lot of literals on the right. And uh, yeah, as you can imagine, the formula can become quite big. So for instance, if you try to install a KDE package, and you look at the corresponding formula, you get a formula which is something like 32,000 literals. So it is a really, really big object, even, this is, it, even if it is usually easy to, to solve. Um, where, is, where comes the, the quality assurance from all this? Well, you basically start looking at a repository. A repository, which is a set of packages, and you start thinking about good properties of that repository. So what does a user see of a repository, you see its own installation. So it sees its package status, which is usually a subset of the packages coming from the repository. Uh, we say that this subset, this installation, it's healthy, so it is in good shape if basically dependencies are satisfied. That's what usually uh, we say in our terminology. And what does it mean for uh, dependency to be satisfied? It means two things. The first one is that all dependencies, all packages which are installed, have their dependencies installed. And we have called that abundance, abundancy. And also, you require that the, all packages are in peace. So there are no two packages installed which are in mutual conflict. Uh, and then we look at repositories, and we define the property of being trimmed. Being trimmed for repositories means that all singular packages, every single package in the archive is installable. That does not necessarily mean that it's installable on your machine, because you can want to have a package installed, which is in conflict with that one, and you will never be able to install the, the other package. But still, there should be at least one way to install that package, 
Otherwise, your package is completely useful, useless, and uh, there is pointless to distribute it in, uh, in the distribution. So, do you think we have some kind of packages in our distribution? Well, actually, we have quite a lot of them. So, it is quite common to find uh, in some of our distribution packages which are not installable at all. And to help out, in the Eidos project, they developed tools which help in finding these packages and possibly avoiding to release them. So, this is a sampling of some of the tools which have been developed in that project. Um, the most popular one is probably Eidos DevCheck, which is a command line tool which you can use to check whether a given set of packages file is actually contains some non-installable packages. And I will show some example of it in a bit. Then there is Package Lab, which is like an interactive console, so it's not interactive in the sense that it's graphical or anything like that, but it is a textual console with which you can play with packages. So we can try to create situation in which the user can end up, like uh, having stable and testing at the same time, and do in, that, in this artificial environment check about whether packages are installable or not. And then other two which have not been adopted yet in, uh, well, only Tart, actually. See if it's an internal component which is used by Package Lab and uh, DevCheck. And the, f the last one is called Tart, which is a tool to help splitting packages into medias. And uh, basically, the idea is that it ensures some good properties, like if you split Debian in 10 different CDs, well, you, you have the guarantee that uh, all packages, like in the third CD, CD, can be installed without requiring packages from the next CDs. So basically that you can install whatever package you want without having to, to do disk jockeying with the, your CDs. At, at worst, you will need to insert all of them. Um, so uh, about the Edos Deb Check. So it's a command line tool. You can install uh, by installing the Edos Deb Check package, which is in the archive since a couple of years now. So basically it consumes at input packages file for apt, binary packages file, and uh, check by default, if every single package that you have been uh, giving to the tool is installable or not. Uh, if it is not, it usually tries to provide you with an explanation, and which is not shown here because it's not the right option. But anyhow, the point is that it is a really fast tool. So, for example, to check the, the all of um, a testing machine some weeks ago on MD64, it takes like 50 second, five seconds to check all packages in the archive. Um, we, are using it quite a, we are using it quite a lot in Debian, actually, for quality assurance. So the first use, it's a um, daily monitor that you can find on the web, which is at Edos Debian Net. And every day, it checks all of our testing and unstable distribution to see whether they contain uninstallable packages or not. And there are reports which, have, which we are using in the QA team to file to check why those packages are uninstallable. Sometimes you have transient reasons, like uh, a build D not catching up. Sometimes you have a convenience reason, like you have a NARC, NARC all package, but which is not in sync with some uh, architecture or any package. And sometimes there are really a, a really serious packaging bug and it should be obviously fixed. So another interesting use of Edos Deb Check has been doing uh, by Neil Williams in uh, MDebian. So basically what they do in, um, in MDebian is before uploading a package to the MDebian archive, they check, even to the unstable archive, okay, they check whether the upload of this package will lead to some uninstallable package in the archive. And if, if it does, they are trying to upload and try to understand first what they, need to be f with what they need to fix before going ahead with the upload. So that's kind of interesting, but is not directly um, applicable, applicable to Debian itself, because from the moment where we upload packages to the archive, it is not in immediate that the package show up in the archive. The, obvi the, obvi the obvious example are build Ds. So you upload for an, arch for an architecture, but before it gets rebuilt on other architectures, it can take a while. So the check you do in that moment is not necessarily significant. And another reason is uh, additional checks like the new queue. So I can do the check right now on my laptop whether a new package is going to break something, but then the package takes two weeks to enter the archive, and so my test has been actually pointless. So what you're trying to think is, uh, whether it would be interesting or not to add some advisory hook to dput to check whether 
uh, uh, only as a warning, you know? So you try uploading a package, you see that it's gonna screw up something, so either it is expected or you need to look into it. Uh, another application is Edos Build Dev Check, which basically do the same game as build at Dev Check, but uh, on the build dependencies. So you basically also provide a source package file, and you check whether all build dependencies of packages in the archive are actually satisfiable. If they are not, it means that there is a package which is not rebuildable in the archive, and is something to be fixed as well. An interesting hack has been done this morning, actually, by Nomeata, which I see in the... What? All right, an interesting usage of this tool has been uh, implemented by Nomeata this morning. So basically the idea is to um, make one a build, use this kind of tool to check before trying to build a package whether its build dependencies are satisfiable or not. If they are not, it is actually pointless to try the build and you can automatically set the package in uh, depth weight. Um, finally, another interesting use of uh, this kind of technologies has been in detecting conflicts so basically, you want, we want to avoid this kind of message which we, seen, we, we see quite often in Unstable, which is package blah is trying to overwrite package file blah, which belongs to another package. And so what we do to, to detect this is basically trying to see whether two packages which can be co-installed uh, actually share a file or not. So we, we scan the contents file, and we check whether it is, there is a way to install two packages which actually share a file. Sometimes there are false positive, like if the maintainer script used dpkg diver or stuff like that, but we check them manually before, uh, before actually verifying that. And we filed quite a lot of bug about that. We do that uh, on a routine basis and help squashing some bugs in Debian. And of course, you might have seen Debian, the Debian weather, which actually show the, the forecast of how many packages are not installable in a given architecture. And this is actually just for fun. It's basically shown the, num the, the amount of uninstallable package in a given uh, architecture and show them in a form of uh, uh, weather. So really bad weather means that a lot of packages are not installable on, on, a, on a given architecture. For example, alpha is quite rainy. So Package Lab is uh, another tool, which uh, it's a console-based tool where you can do various play with packages, and you can, for instance, load current package list, past package list, and play with them. Uh, you can do package installability check on the in style of that check uh, on the installation you, you are building, and you have some kind of functional query language to to check what is going on. So. Um, Actually, there's nothing more than the check, but you have an interactive environment where you can create your own distribution. So I'm sorry for the small font, but on the left, there is basically a, um, an interactive session where you basically check unstable with, it, with itself. So you check whether all packages in a given distribution are installable. Same thing as Edos Deb check. But you can do the same like two months ago if, we have, if you have been injecting all historic information into the tool, which can keep a database of the evolution of a given suite. And you can do also co-installability tests. So for instance, you can check whether PHP 4 and PHP 5 are co-installable in a given suite, and stuff like this. Um, so this was the work which have been done in the EDOS project, actually before I joined that. And it is a work for, for us, distribution side, okay? So tools to help out in doing quality assurance um, verification. From that, we, it starts uh, another project which involved more or less the same people but actually took, to, took on board some other Linux distribution which is called the Mancusi project. And basically the Mancusi project is, fi is shifting the attention from the side of who make distribution to the side of the users. And in particular, the user we are concerned with a system administrator. Uh, so what we do basically is uh, try to address a couple of problems that can show up when you do upgrades in, in a general sense. So when you use your package manager to change something on your machine. And um, as before, Debian is not officially involved for the same kind of uh, bureaucratic problem. But now we are 2DDs working on uh, this project, and we also this time try to contribute code back to Debian. So it is me and uh, Alf Tain. And uh, the focus of the project is what we call the upgrade problem. So problem is used in a, 
mm, generic sense, actually. So a problem is what uh, the, the kind of issue that a package manager needs to solve when you ask it to solve some dependency to install a package, to remove a package, or uh, anything else you can ask your package manager. So of this particular scenario, Mancuse is trying to work on two different parts. The first part is rollback support. So basically, we are trying to provide uh, technology which will help in going back to the state where your machine was before, t before you attempted an upgrade. So actually, this has been done doing uh, from two levels, a technological level. So you're in trying to integrate in package managers technologies like snapshotting techniques or this kind of stuff. Or on a more formal level, like trying to de develop a uh, saner language for a maintainer script than a shell script. So where, where you have instructions that have a semantic that allow you to go back to what, happened, to what was the state before. But the part I'm mostly involved with is, again, dependency solving. So we're trying to improve the current state of dependency solving in package managers. So for instance, I'm not sure all of us is aware that apt-get, the, 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 the package manager we all use, is not always a able to solve dependencies even if there is a solution. So there are a lot of cases in which you have some way to install a package, but apt-get is not able to find that solution and propose it to you. OK? So we are trying to solve this kind of expressivity problem. Um, while doing that, we actually started studying uh, an interesting object, which is the um, dependency graph of Debian. So imagine putting on a graph all binary packages of Debian. So if you take unstable, it is about uh, 25,000 packages. And start, start drawing lines between packages each time one package as a, dependencies on, as a dependency on another package. Okay? The graph you obtain that way is quite huge. So it has about 20,000 nodes and about uh, 400,000 edges. So it's something it's really hard to, to grasp, to print, to manipulate with uh, whatever tool we tried. Uh, for the, the funds of data, this is the actual growing of this kind of graph during the years. So on the uh, X, we have the release of Debian starting from uh, 0.93. And uh, then we, we go on. And basically, the, the growth of this graph has been uh, exponential since a couple of releases ago, and now is stabilizing, luckily for us, because we were not able to have exponential manpower to work on our distribution. And, uh, and so we, we are trying to, to give a meaning to the arrow you have in this kind of graph. So basically, um, we are asking ourselves if the, the dependency between two packages is meaningful in the sense that what will happen when I will change a package in the archive. So in particular, we are trying to ask the question, can I move a package P, which is in the archive, without, without affecting another package Q, which can depend on it? And this kind of answer is you cannot really answer on the basis only of direct dependencies, because a package can be depending on another package, but the dependency can be meaningless in the sense that you have an alternative dependency on something else, and your, user, your users are always using that as a dependency. Okay? Or you can have virtual packages. So a package can depend on MTA, but that does not tell you much about whether the package is useful or uh, can have a problem with respect to send mail, which is just one of the provider of that virtual package. So we, we introduced another notion which is called a strong dependency. So we declare that the package P strongly depends on a package Q if there is no way okay, to install P without installing Q. So these two packages are really intimately related. You cannot touch one without affecting the other. What are the the relationship between this kind of notion and the other notion of dependency. So the notion of dependency we use and we declare in our control file. Well, sometimes they are related, sometimes they are not. Consider, for example, the first example. So here we have a package P, which depends on Q and R. So the fact that they haven't written anything like there means that this is a hand dependency. And we, here we have a package A, which depends on either B or C. Okay, so these strong dependencies which are entailed by this kind of relationship are nothing here because looking only at this, you have no guarantee that Q is installed whenever P is installed or that R is installed whenever P is installed. No, sorry, uh, this, this, this case. So here you have an alternative dependency, so you really don't know if A is installable 
if, 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 sorry, if any time you install A, you have B, or if any time you install A, you have C. On the contrary, here you have N dependencies, and so you have the guarantee that Q and R are always installed when P is. Okay? So the idea is that in touching Q, like releasing a new version or upgrading E on your machine, will for sure have an impact or on P, okay? because it is always installed when P is. So these are the simple cases, but the, the, the other cases get more complicated. For example, consider a case in which you have an alternative dependency, which gives you no information on uh, whether Q and R are installed, but for some reason you also have a conflict between R and P. Okay, and note that this conflict can come, can come from far, far away. It can come from the fact that R depends on a, a lot of packages, and in the end you have a package which is in conflict with P. So in this kind of scenario, each time you install P, Q is also forcibly installed. Okay? So there is some correlation between the two. Don't be scared. I'm just showing here that... Each time, you, each time you have a package that, that, that uh, have a lot of reverse dependencies in the usual sense we, we have, that package has also a lot of uh, reverse strong dependencies. So he has a lot of packages depending on him. But there are exceptions, okay? So why are this interesting? Well, we try to define a notion of how delicate is a package in a given distribution, okay? And we define that notion as the number of reverse strong dependency on the package. So the number of packages which are forcibly installed when you install this kind of package. And on top of this, we define a notion of sensitivity. So the question is, what do you think is the most dangerous package in, uh, in Lenny? So the package that will affect for sure most packages if you touch it. libc? Well, not really there are quite a lot of other packages which will for sure have an impact on, the, uh, on an upgrade, and libc is only in the 13th position. So the first package, the number which will affect, according to the definition, of course, the most number of packages in the archive is a package called zcc43.base, which is a package I discovered doing this kind of stuff. I didn't even know it exists. And for, for some reason, you, have, you cannot never install libc6 without installing that kind of package, okay? So we are not sure yet this notion is sens sensible for defining this sens how delicate is a package, but it still has some interesting properties, okay? Um, so, but still, this list does not give you any uh, information about R, how these packages are related. There are some packages in this, in this list which are related. For example, I can tell you that, uh, libc, th that GCC 4.3 is up there because it is a dependency, a strong dependency of libc6, but there are packages which are totally unrelated. For instance, uh, dpkg or Perl base are not necessarily related. Okay? So we try to check whether we can uh, have a visual representation of the relationship between packages which are really delicate for our archive. And we came up to a notion of uh, uh, dominance. So we have a notion of when one package dominates another package. And the idea of this dominance is that uh, um, a package P dominates Q if the importance of Q is like of due to the dependencies on P. So consider the example that I gave you before, libc6 and gcc. So basically, why gcc is important? It has really a few packages real depending on it. But yes, there are direct dependencies from uh, him, from libc6 to him. So libc6, in some sense, is dominating gcc, and that explains the importance of gcc base. Apparently, this gives us uh, some fun graph, which I'm going to show you in some more details, which kind of show you our distributions, our uh, releases, in a graphical way, which apparently highlights some important cluster of our packages, like KDE, GNOME, and stuff like that. So all the graphs I'm going to show are available at this uh, URL, where we tentatively have also some JavaScript widget to zoom in uh, um, SVG files. And I'm trying to check whether Inkscape is able to show them. Not the Let's 
So sorry. Okay, so let's start from some our old distribution of yours, like zero ni zero ninety three. So back then, our distribution was quite simple. So this is not the all the packages in the distribution, but are the cluster of important packages we had in uh, Debian zero dot ninety three, which I think is fifteen years old now. So we used to have. Uh, uh, some in dialogue stuff on which a small cluster with, te with text stuff and another st cluster still of text stuff uh, playing with the, uh, with the path of the distribution. So um, then go to something I remember a bit, b a bit better, which is 2.1. Still nothing interesting, very, go very big to see. I oh know, sorry, I'm looking at the... Okay, this is Debian 3.0 where we start seeing some more interesting clusters. So for instance, here we start to have some, gno some big GNOME cluster, where you have uh, GNOME, GNOME support, GNOME bean, GNORBA, and stuff like that. Here we had back then PHP Gopur, which I have no idea if it still exists or not. And uh, also we had some uh, still GNOME, and then we come to something we know a bit well. Loading. So this is a visual representation of Debian 4.0. And uh, we start seeing some relevant cluster of packages. <laughs> oh, come on. SVG is a bit painful. There is a Zoom tool here. So this is, for instance, no. <laughs> that was the bad one. Tutu. Okay, he did that. Don't you have a... Okay, I just zoom by hand. Okay, so this kind of big cluster is related to KDE, for instance. And this kind of stuff. So the, we are getting bigger, we are getting more complex, but the point is that you see that this kind of cluster changes from, uh, from distal to distal, and for instance, we observed that there was some uh, very stupid dependency in uh, past releases of KDE, where you were forced to install the all, game, all KDE games if you wanted some KDE amusement. And this kind of forms tend to disappear from release to release when the maintainer noticed that it was too strict as a dependency. So if you want to name your favorite package, you can try to look it up in this kind of representation. So. It is still big, but it is a kind of a more reasonable representation than having a, ah, it's, uh -huh, it's kind of invisible on this kind of presentation. OK, so this is the kind of stuff we have been playing with. And uh, from here, we are going uh, a bit further. So. We are doing the same kind of stuff with conflicts. So we are doing tests where we check wh wh when two packages are really not co-installable at all. So you take two packages from the archive and you check whether there is no way to co-install them. And doing this kind of experiment, we, for, for instance, find out that there was like 1,600 packages which are not co-installable with PPM to FB. And uh, looking a bit more, you, you find the reason. So basically, PPM to FB was, not, was declaring a conflict with Python 2.4. And basically, all the packages we have in the archive, which are Python-related, require a more recent version of Python. So as a result, this package was, completely, was suddenly dropped. So this gives you an idea that strong conflicts can be quite useful in discovering old packages which have been neglected. Nobody knows that uh, they can no longer install in, in any reasonable installation. And um, we, we got rid of a couple of packages like that. 
Um, finally, what you're going to do next, basically in, the, in Mancusi, is like uh, um, trying to improve the situation of our dependency solving abilities in Debian. So the first step is making all our package managers complete. So basically guarantee that each time there is a way to satisfy user request, then the package manager you use is able to find it. This is the first step. And we are trying to do that also, collaborating with package manager developer to factorize out the dependency solving code, because we have a lot of dependency solver in Debian, like one in APT, one in Aptitude, which does not use directly the one in APT. Now we are going to have capped and uh, all this kind of stuff. And we are trying to create a common code base to avoid having unexpected results, for example, when you run a build D, which is yet another version of dependency solver. Another thing on which we are working is uh, providing a way for users to specify uh, really precise optimization criteria when they want to install up something. So for, in for instance, we want users to be able to minimize the download size of packages when there is different possibility when there are different possibilities to satisfy user request. Or the same thing with user disk space. So you will have your package manager which is always able to choose solutions that minimize the installation size, which is quite interesting for instance in embedded, uh, um, embedded uh, scenarios. Or even stuff like, okay, I don't want to install at all any package maintained by this guy because I don't trust him. Okay? So we're working on this kind of preferences languages. And um, of course, we want dependency solving to be as fast as possible. We, I believe you all stumble upon Apti to do, starting to loop, trying to find solution, and not being able to do so. Um, and to do that, we are planning to organize a solver competition in which basically user will be able to submit their dependency solving problems, like in the style of Popcorn. So basically, you can configure our package manager to dump the problem he tried to solve when you provide a request, and we are going to collect them to organize a competition on that. And to do that, to that end, we have already developed a format to exchange uh, upgrade problems, this description of upgrade problems, which is distribution independent and works both on uh, in the Red Hat world and the Debian world. And um, it has currently been implemented in CAPT. So with CAPT, you can already dump your kind of um, uh, dependency scenario. CAPT is uh, basically a, an attempt to implement the APT stacks, stack being compatible with all uh, uh, options of APT. So it should, be, it should become a drop in replacement for APT with a hopefully cleaner code base. And that's it. If you have any question. remind everybody to um, stand up, have a clear view of the front video camera, and I'm about to hand you a mic. Hi. Um, I and an intern worked in 2006 on the Deb Marshall project, which was facing a lot of the same issues with the dependencies. Mm -hmm. And we did a, a simpler thing than I think what you did. When, when you were tracking Etch or you know, Sarge, that sort of thing, we just pulled the packages as they were released and then we tested to see whether they were good, and that let us collapse the version numbers down to what was actually in that particular distribution. It looks like you're attacking the whole problem of all the packages available, and then you find a, a set that would be consistent. What, what do you mean with we, you were testing whether the package were good or not? We well, are doing that just for the um, uh, installability problem. So basically, we check whether they are installable or not in a given distribution. Mm -hmm. Well, see, what we were looking at was you know how on some days, unstable is a perfectly good distribution and you can install it and everything works great. And then there's you know, really bad days where you just don't want to install or upgrade. We were having our, our mirror process would immediately process is, you know, the new incoming release mm -hmm. and go, I can't resolve some of the things in this. So while we'd still pull it and still have it, we wouldn't move a symlink on our file system up to that yet and none of our systems would upgrade to it until the next day when whatever package problem there was would be resolved. Okay. So basically it looks like your target is different than ours because we, we basically, 
well, not we, in the Eidos project, which predates my involvement, they were trying to look at the final product, so stable releases. So for in, from that point of view, it is pointless to look at daily what happens because users are not supposed to use unstable. Okay, so the idea is to look at uh, the final product you want to release and check whether it is good or not, and it is not having the power to fix it because with this kind of tool you pinpoint a bad package and you put your hands and look at what's wrong with him, with it. So, so you are intending this for targeting unstable or for targeting stable releases? Well, you can use, you can use it on whatever you want, but th the point uh, is not necessarily preventing, uh, you know, uh, bad things to happen, but rather looking, finding them. So you can integrate it in your package manager and you, you can inform it you that something bad is going on today in this distribution and you can prevent it. But this kind of integration was not necessarily the focus. Okay. On your right. Uh, I just wanted to ask for the solving issue. If you want, intend to use some existing projects, for example, SUSE has a set solver tool which does the things quite good, and if you intend to use these existing tools somehow. So actually, the, the, SAT, the SAT SUSE solver descend from work which was done in EDOS. So it is uh, basically, yeah, the same technology. So they pioneered the idea of uh, mapping the problem to, to SAT. And then various kind of people started developing their own SAT solver. And one of that was the, the SUSE one. And uh, so w there is currently no share of technology. But once you decided that that's the way to go, th anybody can have his own um, implementation of the solving. While for the, um, for the competition, actually, we, we really hope to have different implementation because SAT is, is vague. To have, a, to have a real efficient solution, you need to, to look into the precise formula you get and different people can do different heuristic to try solving the problem in as fast as possible. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much to Zach.